Good morning. morning. It is nice to see everyone here this morning. What a special privilege it is to get together with God's people, to gather around His Holy Word. Amen. Amen. Now, if you joined us on Secret Church Friday night at the Bible study for six hours and you slept all Saturday, good morning to you as well. (laughs) It's nice to see you. I, I didn't look at the news much, but I don't think you missed any huge news events on Saturday, just to let you know. <clears throat> well, we continue again in the text that I have been going through when I've had the opportunity to uh, teach, and that is in 1 Peter. And so go ahead, if you would, and take your Bibles and open them to 1 Peter. We have seen God's grace all through these first 12 verses of 1 Peter that we looked at. It is full of what God has done for us and what he's done to us by his grace In fact, it's very similar to that testimony of grace that uh, Tyler read for us in Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll come back to that text a little later. But what Peter gives us here in this first section is so amazing, and it's so encouraging that it leaves us just standing in awe of him for his grace to us. And so we have had these 12 verses of this rich theology about our great redemption and our inheritance in Christ all of it before Peter gets to any kind of exhortation or command to us, and he begins that now today as we look at verse 13. Now, last time we looked in verses 10 through 12, and we saw our salvation in other perspectives, other viewpoints throughout history. We saw that all of the writings of Scripture really is preoccupied with our salvation. We saw that the prophets, they searched hard to find things out about our salvation that we now know, that we are partakers of. Uh, We saw that they labored and they served even for us today in their time. We saw that and we saw even that the Holy Spirit of God moved men, the apostles, to deliver the message of salvation. And amazing as it is, we saw that the angels are even in awe and wonder about our salvation. So God is using our salvation as kind of a spectacle, if you will, to everyone, men and angels, to put the glory of his grace on display. And now, Peter ties all of that rich theology about the magnitude and the significance of our salvation, and even really ties in everything about what he said that God has done for us with this command beginning in verse 13. So let me go ahead and read that for us. First Peter 1, 13. He says, therefore, Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in, your, in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So that is the portion of scripture we're going to look at this morning. And let me again just ask God to bless our time as we dive in. Our Father and our God, we praise you as we just reflect upon your grace to us. So much that we did not deserve, we praise you that in grace you called us to be your children. And that in grace you even sent your Son to pay the price that we could not pay. We praise you that he rose again from the grave, giving us assurance that he is alive and will come again, and even giving us assurance about our resurrection from the dead. We praise you for those great promises, and we cling to them in hope, even as we will look at today in this text. And I ask that as we even sang, that you would show us Christ in this text and show us your glory. Let us not squander this time, but let us truly stand in awe of you and what you have done for us, so that we might even better glorify you with our lives. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin today looking at verse 13 with this exhortation that Peter gives us. And as you look at verse 13 in our translation, in our language, you might look at it and think that there's three separate or disconnected commands given to us there. It kind of looks like that. Once again in 13, Peter says, therefore, connecting the text, and he says, prepare your minds for action, 
Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it might look like three separate commands there, but actually what that is is one main command, one main clause, and then there's two subordinate participles that are described for us of how to do that command. They're the means to that command, if you will. The main command or the main predicate of verse 13 is fix your hope. Fix your hope completely on the grace that is to be brought to you. Fix your hope. That's the main verb, the main imperative. And then the uh, preparing our minds and that being sober are the means to that end. How we do that, in other words. And so let's just break these phrases to a little, break, break them down to really figure out what Peter is saying there. So firstly, he says, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. And literally, what that says there is, gird the loins of your mind. Now, that might sound a little funny to us, but that's literally what that says. Gird the loins of your mind. And you probably know that in these times, and even in the Middle East now, individuals wear long, flowing clothes, like robes, things like that. And so if they were to have to run or defend themselves or do anything, they would probably take about five steps and fall over. Because, you know, it's like you ladies might think of when you have to wear one of those dresses to a fancy uh, dinner or something. It'd be really hard to do. Maybe you've participated in one of those three-legged races. It'd be kind of like that. It would be really difficult. And so the idea here is they would take these long, flowing robes with all these entanglements hanging off of them, and they would pull them up, and they would tuck them into their belt. And so now they're free to move around, free to run, free for action, free to defend themselves, to fight, to jump, whatever it is. That's the imagery here. Get your mind ready for immediate action. Get it ready to run, to fight. Prepare your mind for this. Prepare it for action. And so one thing that we learn for sure that's implied here is that there will be action. Action's coming. No doubt about it. And this is not good action in the sense that this is the kind of action that's going to be designed by the evil one to sway this hope that you need to be fixed. Now, the Bible is very clear all throughout Scripture about spiritual warfare, and it's going on. Flip over with me since it's right here to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Peter says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And so Peter kind of reiterates very similar commands here. Be sober, be alert. And here we're talking about preparing our minds for action. And why? Well, the devil, he says, is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's a graphic picture. Now, you may have been to the uh, San Antonio Zoo. I've been there with my kids many times. And you go to the zoo, and one of the big things the kids want to see is the lions, you know, because the lion is the king of the jungle. They're fierce, they're ferocious. And maybe your experience has been different, but when I've been to the San Antonio Zoo, I think just about every time, you walk by the lion area, and all of the lions are just laying around, and they're all asleep, you know, and they're yawning and everything. It doesn't look that ferocious. It seems like I've walked by, and, you know, there's been like a zookeeper walking around behind the lions, and he's filling up the water or whatever. That's not the picture here. In fact, I've actually had the opportunity to be at the uh, MGM Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, and they've got this lion cage, at least they did at the time, it's like bulletproof, bulletproof glass, and there's even a tunnel that you can walk through it. And they have this lion in there. And when I was walking through the tunnel, he actually jumped up on top of me in the tunnel and roared. I remember thinking, like, that is a ferocious beast. I mean, they are huge, and their paws look like they're about as big as your head. You know, I mean, they are vicious. And that's really the picture here. And, friends, the imagery here... And what he's saying is, I assure you, Satan is much more fierce and ferocious than any lion. And this is a reality. He's seeking someone to devour spiritually, to destroy, to rip to pieces. 
And we know from the text that he's actively involved in the suffering of Christians all over the world. It says, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren in the world. There in verse 9, Satan is prowling around like a lion in the world, actively causing this suffering of Christians. And so be ready for it. Be ready for action. Gird up the loins of your mind, he's saying. Now, Satan is not a mythical creature or figure. He is real. He's given the title of the tempter in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, the wicked one in Matthew 13, 19, the accuser in Revelation 12, the ruler of this world, John 12, 31. 2 Corinthians 11 tells us that he can appear as an angel of light, which shows us how deceptive he is. A text that you're very familiar with probably is Ephesians chapter 6. So go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, if you can. In fact, we're talking about uh, the names of Satan. Our text that was just read for us uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, Satan is referred to as the prince of the power of the air. But look at what Paul says about spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We'll stop there, but what a picture of our spiritual war. Paul makes it very clear. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against the physical. And look at how he describes all these enemies, rulers, powers, world forces of darkness, forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so no man can stand against any of that. And that's why we must take on the full armor of God that we might stand firm. And notice that the gird your loins phrase is used here. Remember in Peter it said, gird the loins of your mind. And what does it say here? It says, having girded your loins with truth having gotten yourself ready for action, prepared yourself with truth. Now we can prepare ourselves for action and for warfare with truth. A very practical way to do that is to memorize scripture, to hide scripture in your heart. Hide the great truths of scripture, then you'll be ready for the warfare when it comes. Christ himself, when he was tempted by the devil, combated him with scripture, with truth. He is the word of truth, but he is our ultimate example. Think about it. Satan is scheming to come along and to send suffering and to make your hope and your faith in God waver, and you combat that with truth, with the great truths you know about God in your mind. Truth about God's sovereignty, how he's near us, how he comforts us, whatever it is. When you're in the middle of a fearful situation, you could recite Psalm 23 to yourself. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Comforts like that. Or God's promises, Romans 8, 28. Uh, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So you can gird your loins with truth, combat the schemes of the devil with truth. And the point is, if you're in God's word constantly and you know God's word, You'll be ready for action. You'll be ready for spiritual war. If you're not in God's word, you're going to have like that long robe on. When something comes along, you're not going to be able to run. You're not going to be able to stand. You'll fall over. You'll not be ready. Now, there's a couple of important things to keep in mind also as we think on Satan and as we think on spiritual warfare. You don't need to turn there, but I'll read this for you. In Luke chapter 22, In verses 31 to 32, Christ is talking to Peter, and he says this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. 
So we can be assured, for one thing, that Peter, the very one who wrote this instruction about being ready, he knew something about being in spiritual warfare and being sifted like wheat by the evil one. And something else it says is that Satan asked permission to sift him like wheat. And so we know that God is sovereign over Satan in everything that Satan does. He actually has to get permission from God to do it. That's amazing. In fact, we see that clearly in the book of Job. And also we see that Christ Jesus intercedes for us. He prays for us. He prayed that Peter's faith ultimately would not fail. And man, Peter faced a storm. Peter was so grieved at what he had done and left and ran away weeping. And did his faith ultimately fail? No, it did not. So we can be comforted that Christ intercedes for us. And Christ has told us that in the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Now, next in 1 Peter, he says something related, but not exactly the same. He says, be sober. Now, this could and probably does mean a couple of different things. As you think about someone who's actually not sober, I think there are two main things that are wrong with them because of their intoxication. And by the way, I'm a pretty good authority on this. That's not what you're thinking. No, I... I used to love watching that show, uh, Cops, on TV. It's a great show. And uh, there is a lot of intoxication going on on that show. But number one, they can't think clearly. Again, this is somewhat related to Peter's first command of being prepared mentally. And he's using this drunken, sober imagery here for our mind. Someone who is drunk has their mind in a fog, don't they? They can't think clearly. They certainly can't make good judgment calls and good rational decisions in the state of being intoxicated. Peter's saying, don't let that be you. Be sober. Think clearly. Think sharply about spiritual things. Don't let your mind be numb by anything. And a second thing that this sober command implies, I think, is being aware of what's going on around you spiritually. And again, if you think about somebody who's actually intoxicated, they don't know what's going on around them. They're pretty much out of it. Somebody who's intoxicated is very vulnerable. That's why often they're preyed on by thieves. Thieves know that's a great time to rob somebody is when they're drunk because they don't know what's going on around them. They're not alert at all to their environment. Now, Peter is using this imagery here to explain that spiritually, as children of God, we need to be sober. We need to be thinking clearly and sharply about spiritual things. In, uh, in addition to what he said about being prepared, sort of related there, and we need to be aware of what's going on around us spiritually. I think an excellent illustration of that is war itself, as you've heard it, if you've heard many war stories. But we need to keep in mind here, too, that Peter's readers were these first century Christians who were being persecuted all over the place. He didn't really need to remind them too much that they were in a spiritual warfare. They got that. They knew it. He simply mentions it. Their families were being taken away at times. Their land was being taken away. Many of them were actually tortured to death. And there was going to be a lot more persecution to come under Nero. We, on the other hand, are living in very different times as Christians in America. But that same spiritual warfare is going on. I think oftentimes we can get very comfortable and it's easy for us to forget about the spiritual warfare. We need to be reminded of that. We ought to have a wartime mindset about spiritual things and be on the alert. I was reading uh, online about some of the stories of our vets, our folks that were in combat during the Vietnam War. I was struck by some of the stories that uh, one man posted named uh, Ron Heller, and he was describing how during his time in Vietnam, the ambush was the major form of operations used in his area in the jungle. And he said that a typical ambush might have you and maybe one other person and a radio on 100% alert. I mean, until midnight or even later, early in the morning, just there in the jungle. And he said uh, one of the things that was most frightening is, you know, you're on 100% alert all the time, listening for anything there in the jungle, anything, and you would actually doze off. You just couldn't help it. You'd fall asleep. 
And that would really scare them because they would wake up at some point and see that their buddy had dozed off too. And oftentimes what they would do is just fire a warning shot to scare off anything out there they didn't know about and to wake your buddy up at the same time. Tense situation. And I think that's a good picture of how we ought to be as children of God, not the dozing off part, but the 100% alert part. We ought to be on 100% alert with a wartime mindset. As it says in Ephesians 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against these rulers and powers in the heavenly places. Uh, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Relating to that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is a little section that talks about things that have not yet happened. Uh, the second coming of Christ, the judgment of God that's coming, refers to there as the day of the Lord. And uh, Paul talks about being sober and being alert. And listen to what he says here in first, if I can find it, First Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 1. He says, Now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Notice what it said there in verse 4. We are not in darkness, that the day would overtake us like a thief. A thief generally comes and catches you off guard. You don't see him coming, you didn't expect him coming, and that's the idea there. We ought not to be surprised when these end time events come. We shouldn't be caught off guard at all. We should be alert and aware of what is happening around us spiritually. And he says there in verse 6, So let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. There's Paul's command for us. Paul telling us to be alert and sober, just like Peter gives us his admonition. And back in Peter, remember the main clause or verb of our verse is fix your hope. We are to be prepared and be sober in order to fix our hope in 1 Peter. And listen to the strong language of Peter's command. He doesn't say just be assured of your hope, which would be fine, or remember your hope, or even just reflect upon your hope. No, his point here is fix your hope completely. That is a bold imperative coming from Peter. And I remind you that the Christian hope in the Bible is not the same as a wish or a desire. The Christian hope is the anticipation, the looking forward to, of all of the sure and wonderful promises that have been given to us by God himself. Now, we just read in 1 Thessalonians that hope is referred to as a helmet that you can wear. I don't know if you caught that. In other words, it protects our minds. And I want to remind you of just a couple of things about hope. Number one, listen to what it says in Romans 15 and verse 4. It says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Did you hear that? Through the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Our great hope in God is bolstered and strengthened by the word of God. And so as we read it, we are strengthened and encouraged in hope. If you didn't need one more reason to be in the word of God, here it is. The word of God strengthens your hope. It sharpens your mind about spiritual things. It gives you clarity and wisdom and understanding. It's like nothing else, but it strengthens our hope up and encourages us as we read it. Oh, how we need to be in this word constantly. And number two, listen to what 1 Thessalonians 4.13 says. 
It says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Those who are without God have no hope whatsoever. They grieve, and they are grieved, and they live in a very different way than we do because they are living without any hope. When they die, that's it. As a matter of fact, when they die, all they are facing is eternal judgment. But not us. We have all hope. When our brothers and sisters die, we have a celebration because they beat us to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're there with our wonderful Savior in whose presence is fullness of joy. Listen, listen to what Spurgeon says. He says, depend on it. Your dying hour will be the best hour you have ever known. Your last moment will be your richest moment. Better than the day of your birth will be the day of your death. It shall be the beginning of heaven, the rising of a sun that shall go no more down forever. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the Christian's great hope. This is how we live. Because we have all hope in God's wonderful promises that cannot fail. And what are we to fix our hope on? Peter says, on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. Even in Peter's command here, the very first command he gives us in this whole section about all that God has done in grace, the very first command is fix your hope completely on that grace. This is future grace, but fix your hope on God's grace, on what God has given you that you don't deserve and what God will yet do. Fix your hope on that grace that you didn't deserve. Now in 1 Peter here, I remind you of the first few verses. And look at what God has actually done and how Peter's laid out all this grace of God for us. In verse 1, he told us God chose us. In verse 2, he said God foreknew us. God sanctified us. Verse 3, God caused us to be born again. Verse 4, God reserved an inheritance for us. Verse 5, God's power protects us. And as a result of all that, no matter what's going on, we have joy inexpressible. Can't even describe how joyous we are. And the very first command that Peter gives us is to fix our hope on God's grace. You see how grace is just pouring out of the text here. Fix your hope on his grace because his grace is immeasurable. And may I say that we will be fixing our hope on his grace for all of eternity. We will be worshiping him because of that grace. And he continues... He specifies more about this grace. He says, the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Keep your mind and hope set and fixed completely on that grace that is coming when Jesus comes again. Be waiting anxiously for Christ. This is where our hope really is. It's totally set on the Lord Jesus Christ coming again. Our hope is in the promise of our glorious future with our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to look at Luke 18 with me. Luke 18, kind of an unusual text. It's a parable that Christ gives. And you may not expect me to go here, but Luke 18, beginning in verse 1, says, Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming to me, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This parable of Christ is an interesting one for a few reasons. For one thing... We don't have a one-to-one -one comparison in this parable that's made. 
God is not representative of this judge at all. It says that this judge does not fear God whatsoever. Rather, the point is that God is even much greater than this judge. So what will he do? If this judge enters the widow, how much more will God answer those who cry out to him? And also, this parable tells us the meaning right at the beginning. It says, at all times we ought to pray and not lose heart or hope, in other words. We ought to pray and not lose our hope in Christ's coming. So here we have the elect that cry out to God day and night to bring justice which as we read this parable really is the same as Jesus Christ coming again. When Christ comes again, we will finally have justice. You know, we have individuals, this is election going on, that think that their candidate is going to get in there and he's going to fix everything. Look at all these promises he's given us or whatever. And I'm not saying there's not better candidates than others. There is. But there's no president who's going to get in there and fix everything. You know who is going to get in there and fix everything? Not in the White House but in Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When he comes again, you will not believe. It'll be unbelievable. Well, it will be believable because it'll happen. <laughs> but it'll be amazing. We'll have the righteous judge, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, delivering justice, and nothing can escape his eye. And so here we have these individuals who are anxiously awaiting justice, anticipating Christ coming again, even praying constantly that he would come again. And brothers and sisters, are we living that way? Are we eagerly waiting for this wonderful justice that will finally come? Think of all the travesties that happen in the world constantly. Are we praying for God to come? Jesus, come quickly. Do we pray that so that justice will finally be done? Do we live anxiously anticipating his return? In Titus chapter 2, Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's past tense. Instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Present tense, obviously. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ came bringing salvation to all men. And now we're looking for, we're forwardly looking for that blessed hope that is to come. We are anticipating the appearing of the glory of Christ. Part one of our salvation has been done. Part two we're still waiting for. We live now fixing our hope completely on that grace that is to come at Christ's second coming. The Apostle John did that. He was banished to the Isle of Patmos all alone, writing the book of Revelation for us today, which, by the way, we're going to have a Revelation study tonight at 6 p.m., which is an excellent study, so please come out to that if you can. But he was writing the book of Revelation, all about the second coming of Christ, all about end times, and what does he say at the end? Even so, what? Come, Lord. He was living in anxious anticipation of the fullness of salvation coming. Do we live that way? I fear that sometimes we almost think to ourselves, boy, I wish he doesn't come today. You know, I've got those tickets to that playoff game or whatever. How foolish. We should constantly be praying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Moving on. Look at... Uh, Verse 14 now of 1 Peter. First Peter 1 Peter 1.14 As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance. As obedient children, Peter says, don't be conformed to your former lusts. Just as a side, he's talking about the analogy of us being children of God and he's our father. I just want to say that I, it makes me so happy because I have kids when my kids obey. And believe it or not, that does happen every once in a while. You know, if we say, look, there's all these toys up in the playroom I keep tripping on. Go up there and clean up all the toys. And the kids just run up there, pick up all the toys, and I'm walking through and I see that they picked them up. That makes me so happy. Love it when they obey. Does it not make God the Father happy when we act as obedient children? And he says, um, don't be conformed to your former lusts. 
Remember what was read for us in Ephesians 2. There's a huge contrast there. And I thought it was interesting that David Platt on Friday was talking about a seminary teacher who would regularly get a new class and then he would have them prepare a short evangelical message and then he would take them on a field trip to the cemetery and have them preach to all the gravestones just as an object lesson. I thought that was great. Because what does it say in Ephesians 2? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And it says you were the sons of disobedience and you were the children of wrath. That's formerly. But there's a drastic change. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us made us alive together with Christ for by grace you have been saved and that not of yourselves. In case you didn't catch all that, it's by grace. And it continues there with the differences. Before you were children of wrath. Now you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you would walk in them. See how God is orchestrating all of this all the way along by grace. We are different now, so different that we have new desires, new passions, new love, new affections for walking with Christ. And it's because we were created new in Christ Jesus, created by God. And this is why Peter in this letter calls these Christians aliens and strangers. We don't belong in a fallen, sinful world anymore, even though we are still here now. We are new creatures in Christ with a heavenly citizenship. We belong there. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with me. Paul contrasts this for us in 2 Corinthians. We have a relationship with Almighty God now, and we love Him. That has changed our heart and our mind. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And that's really why in uh, John 14, Christ doesn't say, if you keep my commandments, I'm going to love you. He doesn't say that. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments what he says. Second Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are, are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed us to the, word, to the word of reconciliation. Therefore, as ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, there's a therefore there in verse 17, and that refers back to what Paul said, that we have died with Christ, and it's no longer us who live. We don't live for ourselves. We live for Christ. Christ lives in us. Our old sinful nature has died. We have a new nature, and it has been created by God. The things we once loved, we now hate. We detest them. The sin we once held on to, we desire to put away forever. We were slaves, bondage to sin. Now we are free. The things we once even counted as gain, we can count as rubbish, as Paul would say. Now, we don't live a life of sinless perfection. We're not saying that. But the redeemed Christian is being sanctified. He's being refined. He's being made holy day by day. The book of 1 John deals with all of this. And it deals with how we can have assurance that we are truly one of God's children. We live in a day and age where having a new nature, having new desires in Christ, which is biblical, is thought to be too judgmental. Did you know that? by many supposed Christians. This idea of easy believism has crept into the church and it has, de has deceived so many. I mean, what they're really holding on to is something they did, some prayer that they prayed, some aisle that they walked, whatever. They're not holding on to their relationship with Christ. There's a book written by a wise man called Presumed Faith where the author says, I am soberly convinced that many people today calling themselves Christians have no basis for assurance. That's very sad, and I agree with that. 
And by the way, that is our pastor, Jim Bryan, who wrote that book. And I think there's probably some copies on the, on the table back there still. As examples, 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, Do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. 1 John 3, 8, the one who practices Sin, that is, lives a life of practicing sin, is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. If you are a child of God, and God's nature is such that he hates sin, and the purpose of the Son of Man coming is to destroy the works of the devil, how can you continue to be in practice of sin? It's impossible. It's not your nature anymore. 1 John 4, 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. It's not that love is one of God's characteristics. It's that his very nature is love. God is love. And when we are a new creation, that becomes our nature as well. So how could we not love if we are in Christ? That's impossible. That seems pretty clear. The one who has a lifestyle that continues in sin cannot be a creation in God. The one who is of God loves God and is a new creation with a life that is sanctifying constantly and growing in Christ. We need to get moving along here. So finally in 1 Peter, in verses 15 and 16, It says, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Our God who has called us is holy. Again, like love, holiness is not just one of his characteristics. It is his very nature. He's so holy that you remember that vision that Isaiah had, where the heavenly creatures day and night we're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Emphasizing his holiness three times because God is so holy. This is why sin is so offensive to God. It is directly opposed to his nature. And so Peter makes the case very plain here. Be like the holy one who called you. God is holy, so we ought to be holy. And he says, it is written... You shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, it'll take a couple of minutes, but I want us to go back and see where that is written for just a moment, because we need to see what Peter's point here is. So turn to Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. And we have a text where the law is being given to God's chosen people, the people of Israel. Leviticus chapter 11 and beginning in verse 44. It says, For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. Why does it say to be holy? For I am holy. Look at verse 45. Same thing. For I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Same thing again there. I am your God. You are my people. I am holy. So you are to be holy. Notice that our holiness is not really demanded of us for our sake. Really, it's demanded because of our relationship to God. It's because God is holy, and so we should be holy. Look at chapter 18. Verse 2. Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Verse 4. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accordance with them. I am the Lord your God. Verse 5, so you shall keep my commandments and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. I am the Lord. What is the reason God keeps giving Israel to obey his commandments? The reason is he is their God. He keeps saying that over and over. Now, is there benefit for them to follow God's commandments? Sure there is. 
But that's not the main reason to follow God's law and to be holy. Mainly the reason, the motivation to follow God's law is because he is their God. He is holy and he is their God. Look at verse 6. None of you shall approach any blood relative of his to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. Verse 30. Thus you are to keep my charge and you are... and and you do not practice any of the abominable customs which have been practiced before you, so as not to defile yourselves with them. Why? I am the Lord your God. Chapter 19, verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am holy. I think he's trying to drive home a point here. Verse 4. Do not turn to idols or make for yourselves molten gods. Why? I am the Lord your God. Verse 10, nor shall you glean in your vineyard, nor shall you gather the fallen fruit from your vineyard. You shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger. Why? I am the Lord your God. Verse 12, you shall not swear falsely by my name so as to profane the name of your God. Why? I am the Lord. Verse 14, you shall not curse a deaf man nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall revere your God. Is it for the deaf people and for the blind people ultimately? No. Why? I am the Lord. These commands keep going on and on, and we could keep going. I mean, there's many more, but I think you get the point. What is the reason that God's people should keep his commandments? The reason is that he is our God and he is holy. We are connected to him as his children. I think a practical application for us today, brothers and sisters, is this. Examine your reasons for why you do what you do. I fear that many of us in today's church may just feel pressure to come to church, to read God's word, to engage in Bible studies, to come to Bible studies, to go on service projects or whatever it is that we're doing because you might think that, you know, mom and dad want us to do that. It makes them happy. Or our friends do that. It makes them happy. Or everybody else is doing that. Or maybe it benefits me in some way, it makes me popular. Maybe it makes me feel good or makes me happy, but that's not a good motivation. The motivation that we ought to have for not conforming ourselves to our old self and our former lusts is that our gracious God who lavished his mercy on us is a holy God. In his grace, he called us. In his grace, he chose us. In his grace, he redeemed us. In his grace, he adopted us. In his grace, he promised us eternal life in Christ. Our gracious God is holy, and he is our God. And so we ought to be holy. Now, the final point that I'll make today from this text is this. God's demand for holiness, we said, comes from his very nature. He cannot dwell in the presence of any spot or blemish or imperfection, any sin, and because of that, his demand for us to be holy is impossible. I mean, the Jews proved that. They were given all these laws very clearly, and they did not live up to the laws. They could not do it. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 19. Now, at that time, the rich people were the conservative religious class. And so they were the ones that everybody thought kept all these laws or tried to keep all these laws. They were the ones that were probably going to heaven, everybody thought. And he said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, of course, they were blown away. What? Well, if they can't enter, then who can? Was their response. And the answer is nobody. From man's perspective, from man's abilities, nobody. And what did Christ say? With man it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. Look at Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Here we are, our condition in sin. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to, shed, 
swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of, path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Didn't we see that with Israel? They couldn't keep the law and those sacrificial lambs over and over to pay for their sins were pointing to Jesus Christ. Verse 21, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Praise God. He is the just and he is the justifier in Jesus Christ, who is our substitution on the cross. You know that 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him, God the Father made God the Son, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. Hallelujah. Because of what God has done on the cross, he lived a sinless life and took the payment of our sins on the cross. We now can live in righteousness in him. So, prepare your minds for action. Be sober. Fix your hope completely on the hope of the grace that is to come in Jesus Christ. And do not be conformed to the former lusts, but be holy, because our God the Father is holy. Let me pray for us. Our Father, how we praise you and we thank you for your great wisdom in all that you have done in our redemption. We praise you for your grace to us and for the Lord Jesus Christ who lived that sinless life that we could not live and who paid that price that we could not pay, that we now have new life in him. And oh, how we look forward to that great day when we will be with him face to face in glory. In Jesus' name, amen.